What on earth is this? We're here in the Dutch province of Gelderland, or Gelderland. Uh, well, I am. I'm hoping that you're somewhere slightly less cold. Uh, but the piece of land that we are more interested in, while Gelderland is very lovely, we're more interested in that bit of land over the other side of this body of water, which is called Flevoland, or Flevoland. I'm not going to pretend that my Dutch pronunciation is going to be any good in this video, so you're going to have to go with me. So yeah, that's the province of Flevoland. It's only existed for a number of decades, and that's not because of some sort of administrative delay or redrawing of maps. It's because the land that it is built on was only created in the 1950s and 60s. The Netherlands have a quite remarkable history of uh, land reclamation and geoengineering, and Flevoland is almost certainly their masterpiece. I'm not going to pretend I have even the faintest idea how they did it, nor am I going to pretend that there aren't a number of videos on this platform that explain it much better than I could. But long story short, this part of the country used to be a gigantic bay called the Zuiderzee, and it was filled with salt water from the North Sea. It was so enormous that even full-scale naval battles were fought in here. But in the early 1900s, the Dutch sealed off the entrance to the bay by constructing a huge barrier called the Afsluit Dyke, see relevant Tim Traveller video here, and allowed rivers flowing into the bay to gradually flush out the seawater, and it became an enormous freshwater lake known as the Iselmere. That's already pretty mad, but then they took it one step further by creating two so-called polders, extremely low-lying tracts of land made from reclaimed silt from the seabed, or in this case lake bed, protected by dikes and drainage systems. From the bed of Iselmere, the Dutch created Flevopolder, the largest polder in the Netherlands and actually the largest artificial island in the world by an absolutely ridiculous margin. And just to the northeast they created the aptly named Nordust Polder, which would be the second largest artificial island in the world were it an island. Fun fact, this area was actually supposed to have a third polder called Markavard or Markavard, but the government decided against it because this, the country was rapidly industrializing and they didn't feel like they needed another 50 trillion hectares of farmland. Either way, back to Flevoland. Flevoland is a province which comprises nothing but these two polders. And as I mentioned earlier, Flevopolder is an island separated from the original coastline of the Zuiderzee by a ring of water that allows for easier navigation and also more convenient control of drainage. And because the Dutch seemed to enjoy laughing in the face of God, they even went and diked up this bit of water, didn't they? The little control freaks. So now instead of it being a river, it's a series of long thin lakes with each separating dike featuring a bridge that allows for road access and foot access and cycle access as there's somebody biking down there. Uh, from the mainland to Flevopolder. But one of these dikes is a little bit different, and I'm here standing on it at 7am in January. What a shit idea this was. On the northern end of this dike between Voldeweide and Voluvermeer, there's a fairly low clearance bridge, much like the other dikes along this strip of water. But down at the southern end in 2002, the Dutch opened this thing, the Voluvermeer Aqueduct. It's a pretty striking piece of engineering that you may well have seen in TikTok posts about unbelievable engineering projects, or if you're a few decades older, some absolutely nonsensical photoshopped Facebook posts showing cruise ships somehow passing through it. Rather than a road bridge over water, it's a water bridge over a road. Isn't that weird? Following the completion of the Flevopolder in the 1950s, this dike crossing used to consist of something called the Hardesloos, which consisted of a tiny canal spanned by a tiny one-lane drawbridge, creating a horrendous bottleneck for both cars and boats. There aren't all that many photos of it in its original state left. So I guess it's pretty lucky that they just picked it up and moved it 30 kilometers across to the other side of Flevopolder, uh, where it still acts as a very cute little crossing on a much smaller road with no traffic. That's handy, isn't it? With car traffic increasing throughout the 80s and 90s, the local government decided that they needed to upgrade this little single lane road into the more significant N302 highway, and thus they needed to upgrade the crossing too. While a ferry and a drawbridge were both considered, in the end the aqueduct was seen as a convenient solution that would allow access to Flevopolder without either A. Boats having to stop for a canal lift, B. Both cars and boats having to stop for a drawbridge, or C, the government having to build a bridge high enough for all boats to pass underneath, which would have been extremely expensive, it would have ruined the landscape, and it also would have been at the mercy of very high winds that this area experiences. And so in 1998, construction started on this amazing little bridge, and four years later, it was opened. And yes, while other dikes along this stretch of water only have bridges, these two lakes are a hot spot for leisure boating, and thus the continuity afforded by being able to pass easily from one to the other was seen as a tick in the pro column for the aqueduct design. So how did they make it? 
Well, like much of the hydrological projects around the Netherlands, a coffer dam was used to create a dry construction area before the lake bed was excavated down to the depth of the road. Then a water bridge was constructed over the top with a depth of 3 meters or 10 feet, a length of 25 meters, 82 feet, and a width of 19 meters or 63 feet. 22,000 tons of reinforced concrete was used to hold the weight of the water overhead, while a bunch more steel sheet piling was used to hold the weight of the water and sediment back at the sides. The area was subsequently reflooded, creating this surreal site we have today. Thanks to the Archimedes principle, the bridge isn't at risk of overflow. Any displacement is absorbed by the vast lakes on either side. Furthermore, the stress load on the bridge is constant and doesn't fluctuate as objects pass over it, meaning it's actually far less likely to fail than a traditional road or rail bridge. Aqueducts are rare but not hugely unique, and there are famous examples all over the world. But the Volumamere aqueduct is just so aesthetically pleasing, and so prone to social media sensationalism, that I felt I should come by and make a little video of it. Also just so I can be a nerd about the artificial hydrological systems of the Netherlands, which are quite frankly ridiculous in their scope and impressiveness, as is the power they afford the Dutch to control the seas around them. And even this little tunnel, side note, is it a tunnel or a bridge? Fight me in the comments, contains a great example of this ingenuity. Underneath the Voluvermeer aqueduct, there's a hell of a lot of drainage in order for any overflowing water to be removed from the road. But so far, this has only ever existed as a contingency plan and has never been put to use. The strength of the calculations that were made was so strong that they've simply never had to use it. The Dutch have harnessed the power of land reclamation and engineering to such an extent that in this part of the world, tides no longer have an impact, rainwater can be quickly drained away, and flooding is simply never a threat. As the old saying goes, God schiep de aarde, maar de Nederlanders schiep in Nederland. God created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands. On the face of it, it's not like the most remarkable landscape you could ever hope to see. It's very pretty, um, but when you have the, the context of what exactly the Dutch did to build this, it's kind of amazing. Um, I have a lot of stuff to film today, which is why I'm here at 7 a.m. and it's so cold. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I stopped by. And if you are here, I mean, you might actually struggle to notice the aqueduct because it's so, uh, from street level, from road level, it, you barely notice it. It just feels like a normal tunnel. But then you realize that you're actually driving under a thousand tons of water or whatever. It's cool though. And I'm glad I got here on a day where it wasn't windy or cloudy. But yes, thank you for watching. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Bye.